I am just so, so thrilled and honored that we have Congressman Paulson here this morning. Um, as he and I were talking <coughs> earlier, um, I am just so impressed with the work that uh, Eric has done for us representing our district down in Washington, D.C. The one thing I can say is that he truly rolls up his sleeves and really puts his constituents first. I've never seen a congressman that is willing to work so hard to make and do the, the next right thing and to reach across the party lines. And I, I really respect that. I really respect that. I would like to introduce um, Robert Freeman. Uh, Robert's going to kind of, uh, will introduce Congressman Paulson and then we'll do some Q&A and Robert will be kind of the timekeeper on questions because we want to make sure that everybody uh, can uh, ask uh, the appropriate questions as need be. So Robert, do you want to take it over? Thank you, Maureen. Well, thank you very much for coming this morning. I'm Robert Freeman from Health Partners. I'm the chair-elect of the Board of Directors and I uh, really appreciate you all being here and your support and um, being, uh, being involved in public community and being involved in public affairs. And I'm sure uh, Congressman Paulson will tell you that it's important to, for him to hear from his constituents. And here he has a whole bunch of them, so I'm sure he will. So I hope lots of you have good questions. If not, then I'll certainly kick it off with a couple. So this is, I think, maybe the third time I've introduced Congressman Paulson, and I feel like I'm running out of things to say. So I'm going <laughs> to talk about some of the new things that he's been doing since the last time I think we saw him. And, um, you know, you probably know Congressman Paulson as, as the math guy and the guy with all those little girls who are now getting to be big girls. But um, I think one of the things that I've been really excited to see him working on this year has been um, the sex trafficking safe harbor legislation, which I think you know, as uh, you know, as a father of a daughter and a father of several daughters, um, is really important and um, something where you um, are really an example of something that hasn't been kind of the run of the mill <coughs> business issues that you've you know spent a lot of your career on, but something that's really I think important to to uh, young people um, and so uh, uh, an issue where you've been able to work bipartisanly and um, on an issue that really has you know just important focus and really needs people in Washington to look down on it. So. <laughs> I want to commend you for that, and then just certainly, obviously, Maureen said a lot of what I would like to have said, which is, you know, you've always done a good job of being bipartisan, representing this district, uh, working across the aisle with, you know, Senator Klobuchar and Senator Franken and wherever, you know, whoever else will um, come and join your merry band of coalition members to work on an issue. Um, I think that's, you know, that's really leadership, and that's something we'd like to see more of in Congress, and maybe not less of. Um, so, you know, thank you very much, and we we'll look forward to hearing from you today. Good. Well, first of all, it's great to be with you. And uh, Robert, thanks for uh, the introduction. Now, Robert has introduced me several times. In fact, Robert used to work with me uh, way back uh, in some of the state legislative days. And uh, obviously, he's doing great with the great Bloomington company with Milk Health Partners being so close. And Maureen, you do a great job leading the chamber. It's fun to come here. I've been really looking forward uh, to coming back and uh, having a chance just to spend a little bit of time with you. Uh, let me just do this first before I start, because you got some great people that are members of your chamber that belong to the community that truly do represent, in many respects, the best of public service. Um, I think of Arlene Bush, who you know who used to be on the school board for so long, and to see her here, it's great. Uh, been Thirty-two years. It's like wow. <laughs> You know, of course, you, and, and that's why the schools are so strong, because of less, you know, Fujitaki's leadership. And uh, I just got done with Bloomington Jefferson, actually, last week. So I've gone to 172 school classrooms uh, now, and uh, that's, uh, we're just winding down the end of the year. So uh, it, uh, it, I, I, I'm always proud to do that, because every classroom is different, every teacher is different, every school district is different, but they all have so much to offer, and it's really rewarding to see what, what's happening uh, in, in our schools. So you guys do a great job. Uh, here and of course then there's some folks at the city council level uh, John Olson of course uh, uh, pretty new to the council actually and uh, along with uh, Andrew Carlson and Tim Bussey so just thanks for what you do for the community too because we all do try to work together on common problems and challenges um, let me do this I want to leave plenty of time for questions I, I will touch on this human trafficking sex trafficking issue just a little bit because I was introduced to that partly through Bloomington through driving along with some of your law enforcement I'll talk a little bit, little bit about that in just a uh, just a second but I want to start off my remarks with maybe just a little bit of, of a story that I think encapsulates what the businesses community re relationship has been with Washington or with Congress over the years and think of this think of an old man 
who goes to the doctor complaining that his wife can hardly hear. All right, he's been dealing with her for a long time and she just can't hear any. So he goes to the doctor, he says this is a big problem, and the doctor suggests a test to discover or find out what the extent of the problem is. He says, here's what I recommend. Stand far away from her, behind her, ask her a question, and then slowly move closer and closer and keep asking the question. You can find out what the extent of the problem is until she first responds. Well, the old man, of course, he's really excited to have finally have you working on a solution to this. He runs home, his wife is cooking dinner, he opens the door and he's about 20 feet away and he says, honey, what's for dinner? There's no response. He moves five feet closer, he's 15 feet away, he says, honey, what's for dinner? He moves up 10 feet away, he says, honey, what's for dinner? So he's moved up several times, he finally is five feet away, he still has no response, he says, honey, what's for dinner? And the, his wife turns around and says, for the fourth time, it's lasagna. <laughs> so. It's a little bit what the business community asks Washington to do, but maybe we're not always taking action on some things. And um, although, I, although I will tell you that my priorities are certainly uh, many of the same priorities that you have. Um, and I'm just going to share some thoughts real quick, because I serve on Ways and Means Committee, much like Jim Ramstead and Bill Frenzel, focusing on those economic issues, which are so critical for an opportunity, not to be on a powerful committee, but to make a, dish, a difference in Minnesota's economy, right? Um, and that's kind of what I view the opportunity to, uh, to do. But I'm also on the Joint Economic Committee. And the Joint Economic Committee is this uh, bipartisan, bicameral committee, one of the very few that there are. Senator Klobuchar is on there with me. And um, it's set up as a counterweight to the President's Council of Economic Advisors. It actually gathers labor data, et cetera, and then gives, is supposed to give recommendations to Congress at large on actions to take you know, for job creation, et cetera, to kind of, you know, good policies to kind of move the needle on, on some areas. And one of the things we've really focused on over the last year, year and a half now, has been what's been referred to as the growth gap. Uh, and then what I mean by that is normally the economy double, doubles every 20 years. That's what the American economy has been uh, set on pace to do. But we have literally, uh, because of such anemic growth lately and such a slow economy uh, for at least the last five years and probably just even with the recession right before that, we've added 10 years onto the growth cycle. So instead of doubling every 20 years, we're set to double every 30 years. And so, well, what does that mean? Well, you not only have you know, a high number of people still unemployed, 10 million people unemployed, uh, you've got a pretty high number of people also, about 7 million or so, that are working part-time that would like to work full-time, right? Um, so that's actually a, a very big, uh, big issue. But actually what it really means is that because of that gra uh, growth gap, even if we had just met an average recovery, right, uh, and just had a grade of a C, uh, the average person, on average, would have $3,200 more in their pocket, just in disposable income. You know, so you take a family of four, it's 13000 some dollars. That's real money. And uh, uh, you can do a lot with that much money, whether it's higher education, whatever it might be. That's a significant amount of money. So we've kind of stagnated in that area, and we have, it actually is the worst recovery ever, ever since World War II. And so we're at the bottom, you know, we're bringing the average down. And so we need to actually do things to kind of stimulate economic growth. And then we just had the announcement uh, a week ago, essentially, that said, well, guess what? Last quarter, we were in negative growth, right? They revised and said we were actually in negative growth. And so that's concerning, too, because when you have several quarters of negative growth, then you're back in recession. Although even if you polled the average person, I think they did a poll that said 57 percent of the population still believes we're in recession right now, uh, when actually we've been out for five years. So, I mean, it just kind of puts a little bit of that in perspective. And I just really think one of the best ways to move the needle forward, and we've had testimony on this, is, is tax reform. And that's not easy to get to. And it's been my mission and focus is to do some things around helping small business, helping give certainty to employers to invest in their people, invest in their companies, do well. And that means tax reform, because the tax code has not kept pace with the modern economy. And we can all speak to that from an individual perspective, I think, and what we have to deal with. Uh, tax law, but think about it on the individual side, right? On the individual side, nine out of ten Americans have to either hire someone to do their taxes, right, or purchase the financial software to do the taxes. So that's it, it's a complicated system. You know, guys like Dave Sennis, you know, they make their living on this, but they see it too, and it's it's complicated, and uh, it it it, it uh, could definitely be a lot simpler. If just in higher education alone. 15 different provisions in the tax code with 90 pages of forms, right? Just on the higher education on the individual side alone. And on the business side, I mean, this is really where you have the opportunity to grow, you know, grow the economy and actually employ a lot of people. And the small business sector can definitely lead the way. And small business has not been uh, very, helped very much in terms of actually getting support uh, coming out of this, uh, uh, out of the recession five years ago. And 
we, we approach things very differently. I've mentioned, I've mentioned it before when I had a chance to come and visit with you, but look, Republicans have the House, Democrats have the Senate. Anything that's going to be done is going to have to be bipartisan, right? It's going to have to have support on all sides and, and be able to move forward. Uh, we've moved the president in many respects because at first his budgets proposed no tax reform. Then he was proposing some business tax reform. And he's moved over to business neutral, revenue neutral tax reform. So we've actually, because of the actions we've taken, we've moved him along the way. So it's just harder to do when you're leading it legislatively versus when Ronald Reagan did it. He kind of used the bully pulpit, got the American people engaged, and that forced Congress, a Democratic Congress, to take action. That was done bipartisanly as well, but that was 1986. Uh, and here we are today, you know, the U.S. has the highest corporate tax rate in the world, and we don't need to be the lowest. We just, if we could just get ourselves down to the average, you know, we would do much better in terms of just bringing in capital uh, and investment opportunity uh, without a doubt. So we had 30 plus hearings including joint hearings with the Democratic Senate. First time that's taken place in over 70 years, by the way. But that's really important to do. Our chairman, uh, Republican House, Democratic Senate, they were meeting once a week, all right, for a year and a half. And, uh, or for, for two, two, actually two and a half years, because it's over a two and a half year period. Uh, and then the Democratic chairman was appointed the ambassador to China. So we had a little bit of a setback because now you have a new player and a new person who wants to kind of, you're kind of starting over in many respects and wants to put his own mark, Ron Wyden, who's the new chairman of the Finance Committee in the Senate. We did different discussion drafts, four different discussion drafts. The first three, one was on international tax reform, which is really important to get earnings back to the United States. Uh, second was on small business. And the third was on financial services. And we had great feedback. These weren't bills. These were literally draft papers, white paper discussions, 60 pages of text in each that just said, give us your feedback from different stakeholder groups. The feedback came in pretty strong, and that allowed the reshaping to occur for a fourth draft that was just offered in February by the chairman. And you know, I'm not a supporter of all the provisions of the draft, but it definitely moves us forward uh, on a number of fronts. Number one, it's a comprehensive draft. Brings us down to an average rate uh, of 25, 26% for a corporate tax rate. Uh, consolidates brackets for individuals, simplifies the codes in such a way that 95% of Americans would not have to itemize at all. All right, it definitely simplifies the code. And there are trade-offs, right? I mean, there are going to be trade-offs uh, in in that in that process. But you're also going to get a healthier economy because it, it has been already scored to generate three and a half trillion dollars of new GDP or economic growth, uh, 1.8 million new jobs, and also uh, $1,300 higher paychecks for every person on average. I mean, that's pretty significant. So those are the things I'd like to see us make progress on. It's just a very slow, slow process. And um, knowing full well that, uh, and, and the Senate hasn't taken much, much action on any of the, the tax provisions, actually. Um, we want to keep everything we do in the House, we want to gear towards at least making progress, right? So that's why the draft was introduced. That's why the hearings have continued. And then every year, Congress does these extenders, right? There's this saying that all extenders always get extended. Well, you know what? These are the research and development tax credit. It's been shown to actually promote jobs and help a lot of companies, a lot of them in Minnesota, for instance, high tech and otherwise. Um, there's expensing for so businesses can accelerate their expenses, bonus depreciation, things like that, that stimulate job growth. And a lot of these provisions, they get extended year after year. And Congress does a retroactive tax, you know, savings, you know, six months and, you know, one year, two year extension, but it doesn't give any long term support, you know, for where you're going to invest, right? And because you're budgeting, basically businesses budget for five, ten years out. So what we've done with every these, all these extenders so far is the House has picked the ones that have been proven or shown uh, to actually generate jobs and we've made them permanent. And, uh, you know, that rather than just extending them. So the research and development tax credit, that's been extended every year, essentially, 30 times since 1981. You'd think we'd just make it permanent, right? I mean, after doing it since 1981, 30 times. So that's what we did. We just acted to make it permanent, had bipartisan support. That's passed. We acted recently to make some other changes in the charitable area to simplify the tax code for foundations and charitable giving. Uh, and we also uh, made permanent uh, a bonus depreciation provision, which would help small business in particular. So we made those provisions permanent. You know, the Senate is just taking a different approach. To, to be honest, the Senate's probably not going to do anything until after the election. So we've been kind of making progress in the House just to keep doing things piece by piece up until keep, keep the momentum going, keep the pressure on. The Senate's just going to wait till after the election, it looks like, uh, and do this lame duck process again, which I, I think is a mistake. And uh, they're just renewing all the extenders you know, carte blanche, you know, even, you know, for NASCAR, all these little things that get little carve-outs, right? And uh, we're just trying to sort of methodically 
pick and choose and do a little bit more there. So that's just sort of a little update on tax reform. Um, we're trying to move the needle on some of these fronts to at least make some of these provisions permanent because the United States is the only country in the world that lets important provisions of the tax code expire. <laughs> and so, again, if we want to be competitive, if we want to stay competitive in a modern economy, we got to stop doing that. On the health care front, I want to just touch on one issue because, you know, everyone can talk about Obamacare and there are issues with that, obviously. Um, I won't go into all that, but maybe in the questions you might have some uh, questions about that. But I will talk about one area in particular that I'm focused on now uh, that brings a little bit of promise to continuity to allow the Medicare program to survive and be around for future generations. And that's this area of chronic care management. And what I mean by that is that right now with Medicare, 68% of all Medicare recipients have two or more chronic conditions, right? And so, you know, diabetes, arthritis, and uh, you know, take multiple medications. Uh, and that consumes 93% of Medicare's costs now, all right? So Medicare today is very different in 2014 than it was in 1965 when it was first created. Very different. And that's because essentially it's, it, it's a system that's developed uh, where physicians, and I've talked to uh, doctors about this, where uh, patients go in and it's just, it's just a quality, or it's a, a quantity, right? You're rewarding quantity and just every visit, every uh, point of contact with a patient, there's a reimbursement going to the physician or the nurse or, you know, in the healthcare provider system. Rather than just actually caring for the patient, it's more sick care rather than health care, right? And so four of us got together last summer. Uh, two of us in the House, two of us in the Senate, bipartisan group, again, on all sides. And this is where I had a chance to work with Senator Ron Wyden, who's the new chair, ironically, of the Finance Committee. And we started working on this chronic care management side uh, opportunity. So it's Senator Isaacson, Ron Wyden, myself, and then Peter Welch from Vermont, who's a Democrat. And we put together this Better Care, Lower Cost Act. And we rolled it out in January. And it essentially would reimburse health care providers uh, to take care of the patient, you know, for a period of time. They'll assume the risk, but they'll care for the patient. So it means the physicians and the nurses and the doctors are all going to be working together so that, you know, my constituent, Darlene, does, who takes multiple medications for all these chronic conditions, visits multiple specialists, everyone's giving her a different piece of advice, and she can't keep it all straight in her head, right? Um, it's going to be more coordinated care. Mayo Clinic is doing this. Other institutions around the country are doing this already. So patient groups have come out and support. Uh, other health organizations are supporting uh, the legislation. And we really think that you know, this will be a model to talk about not only helping Medicare, but it's going to save dollars, right? Because with the debt and the deficit and everything, you know, health care is a big driver of spending. And this is a way to reform that system as well in a very positive light. So we're pretty excited about that. It's just also you learn in, in Washington, it just takes time for these ideas to kind of get momentum and move forward. Uh, but again, the good news there is you've got a pretty powerful Democrat, Ron Wyden, who's now chair of the Finance Committee. And you know, he and I, we talk on our cell phones and uh, we try to bring in new players and partners as a part of this process to kind of move, move that forward. So I'm pretty excited about that. That's on the health care front. And I do want to just talk on the sex trafficking, human trafficking issue real quick. Um, I went along on a ride along with uh, an officer in the, in the Bloomington Police Department. And he started sharing me stories about how there are really true issues of sex trafficking and human trafficking in the Bloomington area because of the hospitality industry, right? So many hotels here, for instance, and kind of perked my ears. And uh, I had spent some time learning about this uh, over the last year and a half as well with some others, you know, Minneapolis police that have been doing work. Uh, the Star Tribune wrote a series of articles about this. And, uh, but, you know, then you start to realize this is really happening in the suburbs, right? And uh, there's recruitment going on at, at, at the malls, right, in our parks. Uh, and it's concerning. We're not, and when I say this, I mean, we're talking about 100,000 plus uh, children every year that are at risk of being trafficked in some respect in the United States because everyone thinks that human trafficking or sex trafficking is something that happens in faraway countries, far away from here. It's not in the United States. And actually, it's not true. So Minneapolis is number 13 for our prevalence of how this horrific crime is taking, I'll call it a crime, but th this action is taking place. And I've gone on reverse stings with the Minneapolis police, and you can see there are 12, 13, and 14-year-old girls that are being recruited, and many of them are vulnerable, right? And some are runaways, some go through the foster care system. But just to put it in perspective, here's a story that I had a chance to meet with some victims, right? And I'll call them victims because that's what they truly are. They're not criminals. These are victims. And Diana, she tells me her story where she is a young girl, you know, she's 12, 13, became 13 uh, when this incident happened. And I think she was from Brooklyn Park, and she tells me she's in a single parent family, right? And her mother's really not giving her any of the attention that she should have or the love and care that she and her siblings would need. So Deanna's taking care of her brothers and sisters, et cetera, in the family. 
And then guess what? There is another, there's a, a guy comes in and, and promises to give Diana the attention that, and the love and, that she deserves, right? That she deserves and says he'll be her boyfriend, right? So Diana goes along and runs away with the new boyfriend and within days, literally, she is being trafficked in Chicago, in Philadelphia, in prostitution rings, right? Now she had the courage to jump out of a second story window and escape, but a lot of girls don't because they're entrapped where they ultimately have no choice because they, you know, they've been hooked on alcohol and drugs. They're, you know, they have the stigma, they're embarrassed to go back to the family. Their families' lives have been threatened by these individuals that pull the girls in or their lives have been threatened. And many are also fearful of being incarcerated themselves in the, in the criminal justice system you know, for prostitution, alcohol, drugs, et cetera. So what we've done essentially and what I've done with my legislation is say, look, we should have safe harbor laws. Uh, Minnesota is a state that does this, so on a best practices level, it has really worked because if you can make sure that these victims are getting counseling and services rather than being feared of uh, um, criminalized in the criminal justice system and, and uh, for prostitution, they're more likely to come out of the shadows, they're more likely to turn in the bad guys, uh, and they're going to become productive citizens, obviously. And so we passed this legislation to incentivize states to follow what Minnesota has done. We did this just a week and a half ago. Um, again, big bipartisan support in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a city that can be very divided you know, politically and partisanly on a lot of issues. This is something that everyone has come together. It's really helpful. Senator Klobuchar and I have been working on this to get, you know, she's got the Senate version too, so we're trying to get some momentum in the Senate. And it's an opportunity to actually really do something to save lives. Um, we also passed some other bills dealing with the, with the foster care system, because some states don't even allow students to do after care or after school programs, um, things like that. So students, you know, these kids can live real lives uh, and then get them job services, training, et cetera, uh, job court training uh, when they get out of that, those programs. Uh, and then also deal with the demand side of the equation, because there's a demand where Backpages.com and a lot of these websites they advertise for even, you know, child prostitution, right? And, and I, I would argue there's no such thing as child prostitution because um, that, that's illegal anyway, you know, for children uh, in that situation. But they advertise this. And so we pass legislation to say you cannot advertise knowingly of any you're going to be held accountable, right? Trying to deal with the demand side of the equation for those industries that are profiting off of that. And uh, that legislation has all moved forward. We're pretty excited about it uh, to make a difference uh, in a lot of different lives uh, and, and save some lives, as I mentioned earlier. But more importantly, just to deal with, the, with, with, with all of you, I just want to thank you um, for keeping the Bloomington Chamber strong um, because it's great for me to be able to represent a vibrant small business committee for the most part. Um, one other issue I'll just mention real quick because I do get questions about it, and that's medical devices and medical technology and this has been a passion of mine because we have so many in Minnesota right and this is a big job industry and I've been focused still on trying to repeal the medical device tax that was put in place with the new health care law and the consequence of just a 2.3 percent excise tax right on revenue not on profit on revenue has been the loss of about 33,000 jobs in the country right and uh, it's had a real impact just to put in perspective Minnesota has 34,000 jobs in this industry so it's like you just took Minnesota off the map. And uh, this is one of the things we're, we've been best at in America. We, we created this industry, we develop it, we, you know, we innovate, and um, we need to make sure we keep that strong. And I've got 272 co-sponsors, I think, it might be even a little bit higher now, that want to repeal the tax in the House. We can do it at any time. We've already taken action on it once. We just need the Senate to do a vote on it. Uh, if they take a vote, it will pass, guarantee it. Uh, you know, Senators Klobuchar and Franken have been supporting repealing the tax too, but the leadership will not allow it to come up for a vote. They just don't want to make any more changes to the law. Um, I just think it's a big mistake in, in sort of the conversation of the economy and this industry and health care, et cetera. But they're kind of digging in right now, unfortunately. But if you have a vote, it passes for sure, and then we can make a correction there. So that's been a passion of mine just uh, because our, that's a big deal to Minnesota uh, as well. So thanks for doing what you do. Thanks for having me here this morning. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Remember, we're all recorded here, all right. Okay. I'll look. Mr. Paulson, a lot of feedback I'm getting as I circulate in the business community is the burden of the extra cost of all the new regulation and excess regulation on the part of the government. Is that being looked at? And if it is, what considerations are being taken there? You know, 
regulations make uh, are a big deal. I mean, regulations matter. And so it's not just taxes, because there's always, you know, this sort of perception that Republicans are always talking about lower taxes, et cetera. The regulatory environment is, 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 is probably one of the top issues I hear about in general from the business community, right? And I, mean, I just really fundamentally believe that Congress should be acting more like a board of directors. So if there's going to be a regulatory a regulation that is proposed that has significant economic impact, we should have to sign off on it and uh, approve it, actually, because right now these, these agencies just sort of churn out these rules and, and uh, they get public comment, but they just kind of move ahead on them anyway. And um, it's, it really has constricted job growth. I mean, if you brought in a pile of the rules and regulations that were passed in one year, it, it's something like 14 feet high or something. It, it, it's, it's crazy. And that doesn't even include anything from the health care law or the Dodd-Frank legislation, because that's been going on for years now, and that's still in, in, the, in the process. There's just a lot of uncertainty around that. So that's just sort of my philosophy on how we should have to sign off on those proposals. Having said that, you know, in the House, we've actually tried to reverse or look at specific provisions, and it's part of the 200 and some bills we've passed, but there hasn't been any action in the Senate. And part of this is the disconnect with the administration, too, because I, I do believe that the president is... Uh, or, or, or the administration, I should say, has been pretty aggressive in just letting the agencies do things on the regulatory front that they can't get through legislatively. And so they're going to they're gonna push to do these uh, different regulations uh, that they can't get done legislatively. And I, I think that's wrong, and there's going to be a consequence to that. Um, and there's some new ones were proposed, I think, from the EPA just a week ago, for instance, or this last week. Yeah. On that same topic, I have reckoned with Richfield Bloomington Credit Union. Yep. And the credit unions are dealing with some regulatory changes in the risk-based capital arena. I don't know if Mara and, and Ryan have probably been yep. in touch with the office, but I know the public comment period just ended at the end of May. So if, if you could kind of keep in touch with the, the network and the CUNA on those changes that come yep. out of that comment period, um, there are some, I think there's some larger percentages that they're looking at from a credit union perspective as far as percentage of risk in a mortgage loan versus the bank side. Right. So just if, if you could keep an eye on that. Yeah, I, I will absolutely do this. And, th and you actually present the challenge that um, uh, on the financial services side where a lot of regulations have been very restrictive or cumbersome for credit unions, for small community banks uh, that have added to the paperwork for just in the cost of just getting a loan or getting a mortgage now, right? And um, so a lot of these rules that were supposed to be set out only for large institutions have definitely trickled down to small community institutions that are so active in our communities. And um, that's been another constriction I hear about from small businesses in general, just the, the, the more difficult, uh, uh, it's more difficult for them to actually obtain credit, for instance, yeah. So, I don't know if, how knowledgeable you are on the topic, but can you comment on, I look at Russia and I think to myself, what is their end game and what they're doing? Because yeah. it seems like Ukraine's the gateway for oil to flow from Russia to Western Europe. Western Europe is having issues, which I think is rippling out into the larger economy. And in the, in the end, what are they trying to accomplish? Are they trying to get back to the Soviet era and, and are these land grabs or? Well, you know, I said, essentially what I, what I believe is, is, is going on with Russia with Putin, for instance, right? I mean, Putin is definitely out of the Cold War era and, uh, you know, KGB, et cetera. And keep in mind, I mean, you know, Russia is a very corrupt country in general in terms of their, 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 their business community and, and favors and that, 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 that's a real problem. Um, Putin is also a billionaire, right? I mean, he is a very wealthy guy through that corruption process. And, you know, he stacked the deck to be president and then leave for a while, right, and trade places or what prime minister or whatever it was, and then come back and be president again, essentially. And look, I mean, they moved in, they, they, they annexed Crimea from Ukraine. And, you know, if the Olympics hadn't been going on, they probably would have rolled in a lot quicker. And, uh, and, 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 and done some things. I met with the foreign uh, minister of Norway recently, and um, you know, they're very concerned, just being in the proximity of the area with Eastern and Western Europe, of that type of aggression uh, going on. And so this is an opportunity for the United States to really help lead internationally. And I think uh, we got caught flat-footed just believing that, well, Russia would never go back to that Soviet sort of Cold War mentality. But keep in mind, there are a lot of uh, countries that have Russian-speaking individuals, 
Economic growth hasn't been that strong there, right? If you're not in on the right side of the corruption side, you're not going to do well. And um, so there's an opportunity to ferment a lot of this uh, animosity towards governments in some of these countries. And it's a little bit out of a Tom Clancy novel in many respects, where they stir up fake, you know, fake resentment and that rises to the top as an excuse to go in and, you know, the troops come in. And they did that in Georgia during, right before in the last Olympics, actually, four, four years earlier. Um, so it's, it's definitely a pattern. Uh, for a country like that. But the U.S. needs to be in it. I mean, there's not a lot we can do in the short term other than, you know, do some sanctions, keep the pressure on trade-wise, et cetera. But we need to be in it for the long term. That's energy. That's energy issues, right, when you talk about access to gas and oil because everything is, is oil revenue in, into Russia. And it is really important that Ukraine and Western Europe stay connected with the United States and not be reliant on a shutoff you know, of natural gas from Ukraine, for instance. So there are things we can do with our energy resurgence in the United States, for instance, to help for the long term uh, in that direction. Yeah. Yeah, Congressman, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today. I'm Greta Gauthier. I'm with Second Harvest Heartland. We're the food bank that serves the food shelves and meal programs in this area in, in 41 counties in Minnesota, 18 counties in Wisconsin. Um, jumping back to the health care uh, issue, one of the, the fastest growing group of people without enough food to eat is young seniors in Minnesota. So people who are between 60 and 70, 55 mm -hmm. and 70, where um, they may have lost their job in the recession. Now they're, like you said, they're working part-time or they're contracting, but maybe still have a kid in college and a mortgage. And about a third of them are having to choose between medicine and food and that kind of thing. Um, and we're very concerned about that, and the fastest growing geographic area of hunger in Minnesota is the suburbs. Yeah. So, um, you know, then we look at what sequestration did, and it ended up cutting um, senior nutrition and the, some right. of the congregate dining sites. We were able to get some of that money, from the, a little bit of money from the state legislature this year to kind of tide, tide over. But, um, you know, if you want to talk about chronic health care, if seniors aren't eating right, their right. medications do not work. Right. And they're much more likely to end up back in the hospital. Right. So how, can you talk about what, what's the sense in Congress yeah. about this concept of nutrition and our seniors and our children too, but we're, you know, seniors are an issue. Yeah, well first of all, you know, our food banks provide a huge role back filling the need that government might not provide or helps supplement, right? And so just thank you for that. And, uh, you know, I'll just mention a couple things real quick. Number one, in the, when the farm bill passed, you know, there was a big debate going on about, you know, different uh, SNAP benefit cuts and food stamp cuts. And they got all that worked out for the most part, right? And, um, uh, but there was also a provision in there that I co-authored with Betty McCollum so that homebound seniors who were not able to get to the grocery store, for instance, on a regular basis could partner with a nonprofit or food bank and have that, those, the, that food delivered with their, their benefit cards, right? And so we got that through. That's, that's really good for, for many seniors. I went along with some of these uh, uh, drive-alongs, and then you see these homebound seniors. They can't get to the store, right? And so that's, that's really good news. Uh, on the tax front, one of the legislative issues we took action on in committee last week or a week and a half ago now actually simplifies and actually makes it permanent for food donations, right, for companies and others to give, because that's been one of these provisions that's, that's been complicated over the years. When we just, we just passed that and said that's going to be permanent law, that would, be, that would go a long ways uh, to help the actual donations themselves. And then, you know, on the nutrition side, I mean, look, this is an issue I think we're going to continue to wrestle with about what is the, the best and most appropriate response that we should be doing in terms of helping folks like you in the nonprofit world, you know, in our community, Get the food to where it, you know where it needs to go, um, and then and, and keep the safety net there, right? I mean that, that is important, right? And one of the challenges we have at, at just at a budgetary level is that the food stamp program is 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 doubled, right? I mean in size, it's just grown. Part of that's the economic recession, obviously, and part of it is just sort of rules and things changing. But it's you're right from a suburban perspective, it's 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 actually a little bit like human trafficking. You don't think it's happening, but it it, it is exactly right. Yeah, John. Um, infrastructure in the United yeah. States has received a lot of attention. Some of it's dramatic, like the 35W bridge that went down. Uh, but uh, I think it's generally understood uh, that, that there's a lot of need. Uh, the Highway Trust Fund has been, I think, predominantly, I'm not sure of the balance, but uh, uh, funded by the gas tax. We're having more efficient cars and so forth. 
my understanding is that the, uh, the trust fund will uh, be out of money by uh, July or August. Uh, what What is the direction that Congress is taking uh, on that uh, to, again, as you say, get something maybe more permanent that's a better funding source, given the, the, the breadth of the problems Minnesota are helping? Yeah. So, you know, the, the, you know, the trust fund issue, Again, it's one of those issues where short-term fixes has been the answer versus long-term solution. Transportation, health care, tax policy, right? And that's Congress's biggest shortcoming. I, I do remember, I think it was two years ago when this two-year extension, I think it was two years, it was two years or one year when the Highway Trust Fund was, was backfilled with general revenue money because you need to account and you know, put money in, uh, was put in place. There were like 50 of us that said, sent a letter to the president or to the appropriate folks saying this should be a five-year deal. It should not be short-term. It should be at least five years because those, that's the infrastructure project planning process anyway. And then you, you help the states. You help everybody work together uh, for the long term. Didn't happen, uh, unfortunately. And so what I sense is going to happen now, just, uh, uh, and I actually just had a, we had a memo sent to us last week, is that it's most likely just given that the trust fund is going to be out of money sometime late summer early fall as you mentioned it'll be some sort of a backfill where it'll be extended again for a year or some sort of period of time um, so that'll be filled and i think the latest provision that they're talking about doing because the administration proposed it um, was to have the uh, six day uh, uh, have a six day optional mail delivery for the postal service right the postal service wants that flexibility so they would go to five days and then six days for you know medical deliveries and things like that for seniors etc and then the administration wants that so that might be something because anything you do you have to pay for under the law right or under the rules and so that's likely going to be considered for the short-term fix but then that's just short term that's not long term right so that gets you a certain period of time a year whatever I can't remember the time frame so that's my concern with that approach right now um, but that might be the bipartisan answer that folks are looking at right now that may have action within the next month and a half right now. But it's not an answer for the long term. That's the problem. And, you know, to your point, the reason the trust funds dried up because, you know, there's, you know, you need to find ways of actually paying for transportation and infrastructure in a different way, right? Because the gas tax, nobody wants to raise the gas tax um, at all. But the gas tax itself is not replenishing the fund because there's higher mileage driving, you know, et cetera, going on. I mean, that model's kind of defunct. And so something needs to happen or change there. It does. And it's not an easy answer, but I'd rather just see a long-term. When we wrote the letter for the long-term, we, we had 50 of us, so that's still only a, not even a fourth of, uh, you know, an eighth, I guess, of the body. But, yeah. You know, one of the things, you know, tax reform's been talked about forever. Yep. But are there any things in Congress that that will change the process so things could be easier to kind of get through or make it happen? You know, I think that's one of the frustrations out there for the general populace is that, you know, things just get talked about forever, but nothing right. really gets put together, you know, of a, you know, of a magnitude that would really have major impact. Yeah. Well, it's one of those things where... You know, and I, I feel that all the time because you think you've got a great idea, you've got bipartisan support, and sometimes you, you're trying to get your chairman to move it forward on the committee. Sometimes you're trying to get the leadership to move forward. Um, I was really concerned with the human trafficking, sex trafficking issues that those issues we're not going to get, you know, on a timely perspective, we're not going to get action. And I'll just give a lot of credit to our leadership because what I did was I took the four, uh, three or four articles that were written about in the Star Tribune, and I gave those personally to the majority leader. I said, you need to read these. A week later, he came back and he said, I had no idea this was going on. He convened a group of all the members that had different pieces of legislation on this. Uh, let, and we had, so we had a little task force put it together. We had the committee chairman brought in. And that, that's the way the process is supposed to work, right? And it actually moved through. And all of a sudden, boom, in five months, the bills are through off the House floor. That's the way it should work. And um, so partly it is depends on your leadership and how they, you know, I guess, act on issues. And that's where I think our, our tax chairman the Ways and Means Chairman, he's done a really good job because he's trying, every step he's taken has been one step for, towards a permanent solution on a number of these issues, um, which is why we're, you know, we're not doing the extenders package just for the sake of extending it. We want to take the pieces that actually should be extended permanently, just get it off the table forever. Um, now the Senate, you know, you, you have to do two processes, right? I mean, House and Senate. And the Senate does have very different rules, and I'm not familiar with all that, but, you know, 
the leadership is, and the, the, the leader just has the ability to sort of slow things down. And again, they maybe vote once a week. Uh, usually it's just a quorum call. They just don't, there's not a lot of activity. Um, and it's, it's, it's just changed over the years. And I think that needs to change. Uh, I, I really do. I think I'd, and also we vote a lot. I mean, we take a lot of votes. Um, it'd just be nice to, you know, whenever I have kids come and visit with me and I take them on the house floor and I, I see there's a, a green button and a red button and they say, well, what's the orange button for? I say, you know, that's the, I call it the chicken button. <laughs> I say, I say, just pick one or the other, you know, we need to vote, right? You know, and stand behind how you vote, you know, <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, Dave. Uh, let's follow up on that, Eric. I, I applaud your uh, tax reform. Tax simplification needs to happen. And just, just a thought. If we know in this country that 50 percent, the, the bottom 50 percent of the American public essentially pays yeah. little or, or no taxes, and so I got to believe that so that half of the American public and considerable resources with the IRS is engaged in this paper shuffling exercise every year that just it's just not productive it's not it's not gaining any revenue we're just validating that they don't is there some way that you could think about that in terms of tax simplification yeah well that's one of the goals we had with you know the 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 draft that was rolled out 95 percent of folks are not even gonna have to itemize right and so the IRS comes every year asks for a larger budget right for their you know their employees and their auditing and etc well, they've got their own issues, you know, because they got caught in that scandal where they were shown to be targeting certain groups and certain individuals based on their personal beliefs. Then you had the issue of, you know, even the folks that are going after doing the audits are not paying their taxes and they're getting bonuses, right? I mean, it's just crazy to think that this is actually still going on. Um, and then that doesn't even include the, the fact that how many IRS agents are now, because of the Affordable Care Act, right, the new health care law, how many new agents are going to have to be brought in? Because that was the question that you were all asked when you did your income taxes this year, right? Well, that's just a, that's just a precursor for next year, because next year they're going to go into the details on the type of coverage you have, et cetera, et cetera. This was just, you know, do you have it? So it's really going to be expanded, and it's going to be a lot more bureaucratic, and uh, I, I have huge concern about it. So um, we've been resistant in the House to when, when they come and ask for their budget increases to say, um, no, <laughs> essentially, on, on, on the House side. I mean, that's, that's been the answer, right? Because it, it is a lot of paper shuffling. Um, and I went out with me, went meet with one small business recently, and uh, he talks about he's going through an audit. You know, that's fine. Audits are appropriate, et cetera. But this is a certain type of audit that the IRS was doing where they wanted to train their employees. Well, this training for their IRS employees has ended up so far being a 15-month audit for this small business. They have like 60 employees. It's, um, it's cost them $110,000, all right? And it's just crazy. And uh, this is as a training program for the IRS agents. I mean, that just makes no sense, right? And uh, so now we're looking into that. Um, so there are issues there. Yeah, Oral. Regarding the energy cost, what's your yeah. prediction with the recent attack on the coal for source energy? <clears throat> well, Look, I mean, you know, our, our energy independence is going to have to be a, a mix of everything. It, it really is. And the good news is there's, there's is truly an energy resurgence going on. You know, you go to North Dakota, and I've been to Williston because I went up there on human trafficking issues. That's become a big problem up there with all the growth they've had. There's a big issue there now, and so we did a roundtable up there. But I saw firsthand, you end up in Williston, you fly in there, and there's three flights a day on Delta going up there from here now, and you land, and when I got there, there was, been, there was one accident, four lanes of road. It was like 4.94 at rush hour. I mean, it was unbelievable, right? You go by the Walmart, it's $17 an hour, and they don't even put items on the shelf. They keep it on the, on the, on the wooden pallets because it disappears so quick. That's, that's how, how much activity is going on there, right? You can make a hundred and some thousand dollars just driving a water truck, right, um, uh, up there. So. Coal, coal powers a lot of electricity around the United States, and there are technologies you know, to make it more efficient, cleaner, et cetera, but I think it's a mistake to just to be closing them down, right? Um, that, that, that's not smart. And so some of those states you know, that have a high prevalence of coal, you know, West Virginia and Ohio and Pennsylvania, et cetera, Montana, they've been pretty aggressive on this. That's why they're so concerned about the regulatory side from the EPA, for instance. Um, but I think it's gotta be all of the above. Uh, I really do. And you know, that includes renewables and it includes nuclear uh, as well. Um, I, I believe. Um, Congressman Paulson has to be out of here uh, in a few more. Yeah, well, you, you let me know. I think maybe we have time for one more question. Yep. <laughs>
Yeah. Medicare Part D was yeah. passed about 10 years ago. George W. Bush was president, and it was passed with a wide bipartisan majority. Um, it appeared to me at the time that Pharma, the uh, lobby group for the pharmaceuticals, actually wrote the bill. It's what it looked like to me. Uh, that uh, huge billions a year has never been paid for year by year uh, in the last 10 years. It doesn't look like there's any intention for it to be paid for. Um, and uh, it, it now some of the pharmaceutical companies that have received the benefit <coughs> of largesse of, of this bill that, by the way, forbids the largest indirect purchaser of pharmaceuticals, the United States government, under Part D, from negotiating in the market. The government has to pay what the pharmaceutical companies require them to pay. No negotiation. Now, I read just recently, one of the large companies, two actually, Walgreens, a retailer, and um, uh, Pfizer, a uh, manufacturer and researcher, uh, are moving to Europe so they don't have to pay any taxes whatsoever at all. They won't be a U.S. company. So that there are a lot of parts of that that have disturbed me. Yeah, right. and, and it's like Congress never brings this yeah. stuff up. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, let, me, let me just speak to the issue about these mergers, right, and acquisitions. That, that's the whole issue of not having a tax code that fits the modern economy, right? And so 95% of the world's consumers live outside the United States, right? So we're selling overseas. It's, it, exports has been the one thing that has kept our economy where it's at right now. If we didn't have that going, and we didn't have the energy resurgence, um, we would really be, we'd be in recession. I mean, we, we, we would. And uh, that, 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 that's... That, that, that's the problem there. Um, so you, you want to be able to sell where the customers are, right? And then you got to get the earnings back home. Well, there's a couple trillion dollars that are trapped overseas because Medtronic's got a huge amount of money. They're selling medical devices all over the world. Um, and other, 3M and other companies are. Well, you want to keep the headquarters here. You want to keep the innovation here. That's part of our proposal for international tax reform. Well, um, if we don't make that change, these companies now are making moves because they need to invest the earnings at some point. So they're going to they're open up their operations. They're going to transfer their headquarters to other areas of the world. That's, they're going to do it. And once that happens, they're not going to move it back. That's, the world's a lot flatter. It's changed a lot in the last 10, 20 years. Uh, Medicare Part D, I wasn't around when it started, but I do know that the costs have come in 40% less, right, in terms of where the estimates were. So it's actually been successful on that front. And then many have suggested modeling future health care uh, reimbursement systems under that competitive model of Part D, you know, where you can pick and choose and force these guys to compete. Because where we're moving right now with the new health care law, it's a little bit like what's going on with the VA. It's a one-size-fits-all bureaucracy, right? No accountability. You're, you can't go outside your, your network, right? You can't go to a private hospital. You've got to wait in line if you're a VA recipient, right? In, 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 in a long line, and then that's why they got caught doctoring the, you know, <laughs> doctoring the, cooking the books and doctoring the numbers, saying, well, no one's been waiting in line when they have been, and um, no one's accountable. And um, that's kind of what Obamacare is, is doing in, in, in many respects. That's the concern a lot of people have. For instance. But we should talk about that a little bit and share, mm -hmm. share your perspective, because I need to learn a little more about, you know, you said you had some thoughts, man, part D. We, we can just chat, chat afterwards about that. That'd be good. Mm -hmm. That, that would help me. Okay. So, I, and I'm actually a yeah. VA recipient too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. respectfully disagree with yeah. some of what you said based yeah. on my personal experience. Sure. It's quite sterling, but right. Well, Minnesota's been good. We don't have any issues here, you know. For instance, and uh, we have yeah, we have a chance to meet with the Minnesota folks and talk to the VA here. Um, they have a waiting list here, right? Um, you know, there's a wait. They're waiting. Too, folks are waiting too long. Uh, but in other areas of the country, obviously, there's been a big problem. You know. So. Eric, I would just say you followed two great. Congressman, and you're doing a wonderful job. In yeah, well, thanks. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks for having me here. Thanks.